Aloha, kia ora. I'm Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Centre and host of the East West Centre Insights. The East West Centre is a cutting edge research and capacity building institution, and we're based right here in Hawaii. And our mission is to forge a deeper understanding and greater connection between the East and the West. So every two weeks here on the show, which is on Tuesdays at two o'clock, I'll have a conversation with an East West Centre expert or somebody uh, from our global network about critical issues facing the Asia Pacific region. So check us out here at eastwestcenter.org slash insights. And today um, our guest is uh, a good friend of mine, Celeste Connors, and she's executive director of Hawaii Green Growth, local 2030 hub, and an East West Center senior adjunct fellow. So Celeste has 20 years of experience working at the intersection of economic, environment, energy, and international development policy. And before joining Hawaii Green Growth, she was also the CEO and co-founder of CDOT's Development. She previously served as Director for the Environment and Climate Change at the National Security Council and National Economic Council, where she helped shape President Obama's climate and energy policies. And then before that, she served as a US diplomat in Saudi Arabia, Greece, and Germany. And so today we're gonna to be talking about how islands are building back better after COVID-19 or during COVID-19 and um, how the local 2030 Islands Network is helping to facilitate those efforts. So hi, Celeste, thanks for joining us today. Aloha, Karina, it's a pleasure being on the show. It's been ages, it's been about an hour since I saw you last, it's right? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just wanted to ask you all about your work today and let's just um, start off with talking about what we were just talking about before we came on about the particular advantages that islands have in dealing with situations like COVID-19 and climate change, and then what the disadvantages might be. Yeah, no, that's a that's an interesting question, uh, Karina, because I think very often as islands, we see the disadvantages first, that we are vulnerable to catastrophic events and severe weather um, events, um, hurricanes, cyclones, and all of the above. But I think the, the focus on the positive is that as a result, um, islanders are better equipped and in many cases more used to looking at uh, long-term resiliency as a essential strategy. And I guess when we think about COVID, to me, it's inherently about disruption. Um, and it's about projecting forward to a potentially climate disrupted future. Um, if we go back and look at what the science is telling us, it's that we have really less than a decade at this point to um, avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change by having sectoral change across the board. And that's really gonna require a lot of collaboration and partnerships. And I think that's, so, you know, one of the key points for me, that's actually what I think islands do quite well is partnerships and collaboration and systems thinking and networks. You know, um, there's a lot of talk these days about a circular economy, uh, which to my mind is really an island economy. Um, and as, as we talked about earlier today, I think islands in many cases have a thousand years of knowledge on systems thinking, on ways to structure your economy, your society, uh, your culture in a way that is uh, mindful of resources, resource availability, um, and the communities and the, um, you know, from ridge to reef, uh, Alko to Makai and the communities in between. And so when we think about what other economies are now trying to do with the circular economy, they can look to islands as models. So while at this present moment, you know, without a doubt, islands are certainly suffering because of the impacts of COVID. Um, it has to do with supply chain disruption because we still have a lot of these dependencies on imported energy, oil, uh, imported food. Um, but I think this at the end, quite honestly, the disruption to the tourism economy, which is really hitting islands hard. So at this present moment, there is a lot of um, pain and there's a huge pain point. Hawaii in particular has gone from having some of the lowest unemployment rates in the country to some of the highest almost overnight. Um, and that's as a result of uh, the COVID disruption. But at the same time, the cases have, have been lower than in other parts of the country. And so what this means is that people are really trying to balance the um, need to get back to get back their livelihoods, but to do so in a very thoughtful way. So I think this is what we're seeing in Hawaii, um, including the tourism economy, right? So we weren't, um, many folks would agree that we weren't entirely on a sustainable pathway prior to COVID, 
And so therefore, our Hawaii Tourism Authority in their most recent strategic plan, their five-year strategic plan, had actually laid out a more, um, I guess, resilient pathway forward for the tourism economy, one that focused on a better relationship between the visitor and the community, one of collaboration. And this was actually premised a lot on the Aloha Plus Challenge goals and the need to look at that community component and balance the ecosystem. So all of this to say is that I think that while Islanders are really hit hard by COVID, um, when we look at stabilization, recovery and resilience and the opportunity for the circular economy or an island economy, an island worldview to be a starlight for economic development and recovery, I think islands are actually very well positioned. I love the way you frame it. I think that's really empowering. And um, and then in the Pacific in particular, you know, where there actually has been widespread success in terms of um, uh, trying to address, you know, the more dire aspects of COVID-19, AKA dying. I mean, they're just, uh, they're, I think right across the entire Pacific, it's only been um, seven, seven souls that we've lost. And so in, the, in a way that does free us up to look at the sort of the acute issues surrounding employment. Um, and you mentioned the Aloha Plus challenge um, and the sustainability of the path that we were on in Hawaii before COVID-19. But before we get to that, because I really want to drill down to that, um, I think it'd be helpful if we talked a little bit about what Hawaii green growth is exactly. Um, and, then, and then we'll slide right into the Hawaii Plus challenge. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a couple of slides to share in a minute, but I would say what's exciting is Hawaii Green Growth um, is inherently, um, well, it's a, it's a network-based organization. Um, it's a group of partners that have come together across sectors and it's a uh, decade old. Hawaii Green Growth um, is a community-driven partnership. It actually emerged, Karina, following the last financial crisis in 2008. And that's what's interesting is a lot of people think because it's green, it's more on the environment side, but actually it's an, it's an economic recovery strategy. So um, I was actually in the White House during last period and really what we were working on with the other um, developed economies through the OECD was a green growth recovery. And at the same time, the UN had a green economy report that is actually what led to the Rio plus 20 conference, which then um, from which emerged the sustainable development goals. But the green growth uh, strategy was also adopted at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting, which took place in Honolulu in 2011. And that's when a group of enlightened leaders got together and said, hey, we should get on a green growth pathway. And that's how Hawaii Green Growth emerged. Um, and the early founders of that group, as I said, included folks from civil society and government um, and business and uh, youth involvement as well. So it's actually quite dynamic and exciting. Um, so what this, so where we are right now is we feel like we've been working on a green growth economic recovery for the last 10 years. So I think we're well positioned and that is really sort of um, illustrated in the Aloha Plus challenge. So actually, if we do go to look at this first slide, I think it's really colorful, um, which is why I like to show it. But what, what you have here is the Aloha Plus challenge is Hawaii's statewide sustainability framework um, launched in 2014. Uh, with our state leadership, the counties, um, our legislative leaders, both the House and the Senate, and our, again, our civil society partners, businesses, um, and others. And so what you have here are six goals, including, you know, clean energy and natural resource management, green workforce, education, smart, sustainable communities. And these are time bound, Karina. So these Aloha Plus challenge goals are to be achieved by the year 2030. I had the other wheel on there because for those who might not recognize those, those are the sustainable development goals. And those are 17 goals also to be achieved by the year 2030 that all member states of the United Nations agreed to in the year 2015. So you'll notice that Hawaii's sustainability framework um, was launched a year prior to the UN goals. And that is actually critically important because right now the, the world has rallied around these big, at goal 17 goals, including climate change, uh, reducing or eliminating poverty, energy efficiency, re renewable energy, energy access, the whole gambit. And the whole idea behind these goals is that progress in one goal requires progress in the other goals in order to be successful. So that's that integrated approach, which is exactly why islands and an island model 
can and can be leading the world in this. The Aloha Plus Challenge Goals, how did we even get here? Um, you and I were in a panel uh, a couple hours ago, which is really exciting with some of our great technology leaders from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Shift7 and Google, former Google and Microsoft um, leaders. And basically what it all came down to is community. Um, I think Megan Smith said, you know, the digital platform is like a pencil. It, you know, it's, it's not the thing itself, it's, it's what it communicates and how you actually are getting that information. And what also came up was we measure what matters. And so what we Hawaii Green Growth did is we, we went to the community to find out what mattered to the community and together determine the metrics and indicators over three years statewide um, multi-sector collaborative process. And those are the metrics. So we have six goals related metrics and indicators actually rolling up to the entire SDG framework. Um, and, right. and that's actually what was determined. Um, if you, I think it might be slide two, which, what's exciting is um, this might be the, the dashboard. Actually, no, let me, that slide two, I think actually demonstrates what I just said. This is who, how do you make this possible? It's the community, it's the network. And this is literally just a snapshot of our network, right? You can see there the diversity of the partners and these partners are committed through four different working groups that we constantly iterate to make sure that we're making progress that we're continuing to measure what matters, that we're identifying gaps, looking for opportunities to drive action. And so the third slide I'll just highlight here is the Aloha Plus dashboard. Um, now, this is where you can find all the data, the information. It's not a static process. We're constantly iterating on these goals. For example, hopefully soon we'll have online new gender um, metrics um, and Vahikapuna metrics and indicators. And I think it's, it's not actually the HUG staff that determines what goes on there. It's part of a collaborative process to make sure that we have the right stakeholders in the room to do that. And that is on the state.gov website. So it really shows some a real commitment, uh, transparency and accountability for all of us collectively to be achieving those goals. Um, so I think that's-, it that's is, um, back Yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry, just to back up just so um, to, to really understand so the network uh, I've, always, I've always really wanted to understand this because I get like how private public partnership works in theory. But what I really liked about you, what you've done is you've tried to put a bit of a structure around it. You know, because when we first started talking about it, it did seem very organic. I was like, how are you going to ever get any board momentum? So you've got like four working groups. And so what did what do they do? That like all of the different organizations come together in four groups. And what are what what are those? I remember there's a policy and legislation one, but perhaps if you can walk us through it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, again, this is probably me as a former diplomat and former um, NSC person. It's that it, the process matters, but not so that it undermines the outcome, right? We have process in place to drive outcome. And so the working groups are exactly that, right? Um, it's our, allowing our members to select the areas that they're most passionate and interested in and relate most to their current work. And so one is a policy and legislative working group, we have a local global next gen, next generation working group. Uh, we have the measures working group. And we're also really excited to be working with our business leaders. Uh, we convene the sustainability business forum and it's a group of 24 Hawaii based CEOs that last year were invited to join the global compact. And that's the group of over 9,000 companies globally that have signed on to the sustainable development goals and these 10 principles. Um, so it's really exciting. And this group, the business leader group, they're really pioneering market-based mechanisms to address uh, climate challenges, including a carbon offset pilot. They are looking at sustainable tourism and how we can have a more sustainable sector. Um, and they're also looking at what they can commit to now, today, to improve their efficiency and uh, resilience and sustainability through the Green Your Business Initiative. Further, Karina, right. our business leaders, they want to be tracked on the dashboard. And so they are disclosing right. information about what they're doing, which is really extraordinary. So how do we make this happen? Um, our focus is to move the middle and that's part of it. So in other words, what, what we do is we, we are constantly working to make sure that it is truly a partnership, that we are actually having the conversation. Um, because I think mm. to my mind, um, we often know what we need to be doing. We often have a technology solution. 
I think the challenge is, um, and sometimes and very often involves trade-offs. And partly where we sometimes melt down is where we uh, don't have a conversation about the trade-offs and we're perceived to cut corners in the conversation and the dialogue. And so I think what we do with the goals and the dashboard, it really makes these trade-offs explicit. And sometimes we as a community can recognize there are things that are not perfect in this approach. However, we're moving forward with this because it has these broader benefits. And that's right. really how policy uh, can move forward is collectively. So there is, there is a function to that. Um, we convene over 50 meetings a year between all of our working groups and our business forum. Um, and now we're really part of the local 2030 Island Network, which I'll share more about as well. So. Yeah, but uh, before you get there, um, you know, you talked about, so, I mean, it's, what's fascinating to me is a network within a network within a network, and then you put a whole structure around it. So, so um, there is actually action. And then right at the top of that tree is the, is the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, of which you were one of the negotiators for. And just, uh, it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about that and how, sort of how um, Hawaii Green Growth docks on to that. And then maybe um, uh, just talk about how it relates to the, mill the Millennium Development Goals, um, just for yeah. if there are any skeptics out there. Yes, you know, I, I mean, I love that you've mentioned the Millennium Development Goals, you know, that um, really from the Earth Summit set the development agenda for 15 years from 2000 to 2015. And, you know, the World Bank and IMF and UN rallied around these goals um, that were very development, traditionally development focused on child and maternal health and education, um, poverty. And what happened, you know, with Rio plus 20, I think there was this idea that, you know, something was missing or that we needed to look at this other pillar, right? So you, the three pillars of this, the three legs of a stool, right, are economic, social, and environmental. Um, and for me, I think all of this is amplified and really successful through culture is really what we see in Hawaii um, is the real opportunity. And so what happened is when we were thinking about the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals expiring, what would emerge next? And it wasn't entirely clear even after Rio plus 20, the big meeting. But what did emerge are the sustainable development goals. And again, that's looking at economic, social, environmental issues across the board. It includes climate change and all of these issues that we've talked about. Now, having worked at the macro level, as you indicated, sometimes on climate issues as well as energy and sustainability, when you work on these large platforms, sometimes you're left wondering how and when do they get implemented because the action is critically yeah. important. Did it work? And no. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> and I think this is exactly the point I think you're implying is that the UN recognizes this as well. And they recognize that the solutions are gonna come from the local level. And that's why actually they have looked to identify bright spots. Um, you know, and, and actually before I, before I even continue, you know, that reminds me, I'm, I'm really honored to sit on the board of the Global Island Partnership. And it's important to say, while well, green growth and the Aloha Plus Challenge emerged, um, it's probably best for me to go back to the genealogy of Hawaii green growth. It was informed by the green growth strategy, but it has a much deeper and longer uh, genealogy in Hawaii with Malama Hawaii, uh, which uh, was really um, informed by, uh, late Senator Kenneth Brown's um, 1973 speech on the Malama ethic. And that was really this, I think that he predicted the SDGs in this speech oh. because it's the lens through which we should see if we should proceed with certain activity um, is through these island values of Malama and Kuleana and Aloha. And I think that was critically important for HGG moving forward. I think the Aloha Plus challenge, going back to your first question about islands, was inspired actually by other islanders. Um, you had the Micronesia challenge, right? Yeah. That you're familiar with. The Micronesia challenge was so extraordinary and it actually inspired the Caribbean challenge. And then right. we had a, a, a ambassador from Seychelles, ambassador Ronnie Jumeau come to Hawaii and challenge Hawaii to be a model for sustainability. And then you had the Aloha Plus challenge. So what it is is this ecosystem of islanders inspiring other islanders and working together um, which I think is really the exciting part of the, the local 2030 island network and the opportunity there. So um, 
I yeah, now well, let's lost. talk about that now. No, because yeah. um, we've got um, we've got about ten minutes, and that's a great segue into um, what we're all doing together in the in the local twenty thirty islands network. You know, maybe you know what it is, who are the key drivers, you and Kate and Melissa, um, and uh, and just some of the just the really like inspiring, but also very practical. Um, tools and vehicles that um, you and we have been exploring via that network in this COVID era. Yeah, and, and we're, you know, we're delighted to be partnering with uh, PIDP on this as well in you, Karina. Um, so this is the local 2030 island network. So I was going to actually, if you wanted to go to slide four, if I can remember the slide order here um, of our hubs. Yeah, so, so basically this ties into your last question. How does this all plug in? So essentially what happened is upon realizing, you know, the United Nations that we really need to look at local solutions, they identified Hawaii as a model for sustainability based on what we were already doing. And so that's also a really important point. It was not acknowledging Hawaii any aspirations to sign on to the SDGs. Rather, it was the commitment that we had to the Aloha Plus Challenge to our local model and how that could be a locally and culturally appropriate model in other places. Um, and so as part of us agreeing, uh, and we had UN officials come to Hawaii to formally launch the Local 2030 Hub, um, as part of that, they said, how could we work, how could Hawaii help uh, work with other island economies to also um, help shape their locally and culturally appropriate and relevant goals? And so with the Global Island Partnership together, we launched the Local 2030 Island Network at the UN General Assembly last year, many folks in our network were there, which is exciting from the counties um, and some of our civil society partners, um, as well as business partners. So it was an exciting time. And as part of this network, um, it's really looking at these four principles of how do you have, uh, it's focused on the partnerships, right? And leadership. It's also looking at how we track progress and hold ourselves collectively accountable in whatever format. For us, that's the, that's the Aloha Plus dashboard. Um, and there's also the commitment to action, right? So how can we learn from each other? Hawaii is constantly learning from our other island partners and we hope that we can share some of the solutions that we're, we're working on as well, uh, the common challenge that we face. Um, now, when we were setting this up, Karina, COVID hit and we have an interim steering committee chaired by Ambassador Spencer Thomas from Grenada. We talked to Spencer and decided rather than slow down our programming, we probably should accelerate it because we wanted the conversation. We needed the conversation with our island partners because we were all feeling that pain point with the disruption, with disruption to tourism, food security, um, other types of challenges that we were facing. So what we did is we responded through a COVID platform. And this has been the conversation that we've actually been having um, with partners, we've been convening about every two weeks uh, we did a survey to actually find out what the priorities are and so we've been having a very robust dialogue and it's really exciting to see what other islanders are doing um, to basically uh, manage during these difficult times yeah i mean it's exciting it's also really inspiring and just for me as as a punter um as part of that as part of that platform i think what was also really helpful was to hear um was just to hear the spread of ideas, you know, in in the Pacific, not all of them are immediately applicable, but they will be applicable in the future. And we talked about this this morning, we're talking about innovation and technology. Um, and I made some comments about uh, sort of the low um, penetration points, like in the North Pacific, on average, there's about 30% of the population using the internet in, in Micronesia, um, but that's only today. And, uh, you know, last year, the World Bank, um, signed a really big deal with the Federated States of Micronesia. And, um, you know, by the time we get to 2040, you know, they're likely to be up around 80% of that population. And so, you know, even, um, you know, for those of us uh, chiming in to some of those discussions, uh, you know, like they might seem you know, far away in the future right now, but maybe they're five years away or 10 years away. Um, and so I, I've got a list here of some of the things that you were talking about, um, that we've been talking about on the network. Um, Today we talked about data and innovation, and um, but you also talked about tourism right up, and I know that that's a, a topic of incredible interest here. And I just wondered if you could remember any. That was six weeks ago, but if you remembered any takeaways from that particular discussion. Yeah, no, I think look, I think the issue with tourism is that it's it is part of our um, economic strategy going forward for islands and Hawaii as well. 
And it can be done in a way that, again, focuses on the relationships and the connection, the relationship between the visitor uh, and the resident. And that can be a collaborative um, partnership, one that does focus on stewarding our resources um, and one that actually does support. And ultimately, the tourism sector will change um, as a result of COVID, but it will be, it can be a fo force for, you know, diversifying the economy and looking at regenerative tourism, right, which is actually achieving multiple benefits across different sectors. Um, we've talked about our businesses, you know, a lot of our businesses are involved in the tourism economy and they view themselves as anchor institutions, but also when we look at, you know, economic activity as far as hubs, tourism brings in revenue, um, through you know taxation but it also provides uh, jobs across you know a diversity of sectors so i think tourism is going to be part of our mix going forward it's a question of how we do this again i, I think the hawaii tourism authority five-year strategy really uh, lays that out very well um, and it was kind of interesting what we did i should note with the dashboard um, is we actually ran a survey across our statewide network to look at what are the jobs that are available right now you know, that are shovel ready off the shelf, whether it's a farm to a school program that with additional support, it could be scaled, um, you know, fish right. pond management. So what we did is we ran the survey, we got over 350 responses, Karina. So we've identified over three, like 9,000 jobs currently available across the state at, you know, around $585 million. We could actually put folks back to work. It includes tourism, but looks at tourism and other types of a diversified economy. Um, what was interesting too, going back to the panel was on the data and innovation and what we're seeing as COVID has forced us into practices um, that include remote working, right? Or remote school in the case of my kids, right? And my husband, who's a teacher. And what it has done yeah. is shed light on connectivity. Hey, Celeste. I've yeah. just done a terrible job of cheering. I've got one minute. I've got my team saying, "Hey, we're going to go one Wrap minute." It up. I just really wanted to, yeah, I just really wanted to hear what you had to say. But in the in the in the last thirty seconds, um, I I really have to thank you. And where can we find out more about this stuff? Yeah, so I would go to the Aloha Plus Challenge dashboard to look at the job survey, our COVID response. Um, that would be the most timely information. I think we really got to get folks back to work. That is going to help support a more resilient and equitable future for Hawaii. Thanks, Celeste. Always, I always learn something talking to you and really appreciate you taking the time today. We've become Zoombies. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. And we're going to stick something on the um, East West Center website so you can find out exactly um, those resources that Celeste was just referring to. And um, see you next week. Aloha. Thanks so much, Karina. Aloha. Oh, I just wondered how um